Margin podcast interviews with Dr. Pam Edinger, president of Bunker Hill Community College. Um, and this is the last in a series of podcasts on student success that we are doing in conjunction with the 20th anniversary of SESI. Uh, we will delve into a number of topics today, but we will um, eventually hone in on why and how student support services uh, matter. So welcome, Dr. Edinger, and I hope I'm saying your name correctly, right? Well, please just call me Pam. Okay, all right, we'll go with Pam. I'll try. <laughs> okay, here we go. Hey, Pam. But um, interesting, you're at uh, Bunker Hill Community College. Um, I, the first time I heard the name of that school when I started working at Diverse many years ago, I was like, oh, wow, how cool. Um, there is a college, um, I'm imagining, sitting on the site of where the Battle of Bunker Hill took place. Yeah, li literally the monument is up the street and I can see it from my window. Really? OK. Yeah, it, it is, you know, kind of a at times when we pause and are from our daily you know, craziness that 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 we experience. It, it really gives you a sense of 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 distance and history and and how far we've come and and how the questions really about student success and education has come. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. because it, it, certainly the history of, of Boston is is no news to anyone. Um, but come forward, you know, to four hundred years. Um, we were built 50 years ago, and I can tell you the students that we served 50 years ago looks nothing like the students that we have today. Oh, I can imagine. I could right. Imagine. It was uh, we were we, we were built to serve like 5000 students. They were they were white. They were male. They were um, I wouldn't say selective, but certainly um, didn't have the kind of diversity that we have now. I mean, we're serving 16000 students. Mm -hmm. in the same space, mind you, so we're sitting on top of one another. Right, um, right. So we, we, we are diverse um, within our diversity, a quarter white, quarter black, quarter Latinx, 15% Asian, mm -hmm. and 10% a mixture of everything else, right? So, so we, are, we are emblematic of, I would say, a mid-size community college um, in the urban landscape. Right, right, right. All of the beautiful cultural wealth and assets that comes along with that, along with all the challenges that we, you know, that we've experienced over time. So being in Charlestown, being at Bunker Hill Community College, right, really gives you a sense of human history. Mm -hmm. it, it's an interesting place. Yeah, I mean, lots of history. I mean, I was, um, you know, I was thinking about it and I was preparing and I was like, let me go back and read what I remember about Bunker Hill, you know, the Battle of Bunker Hill, Bunker Hill, rather. Um, and interestingly, I was reading that the battle has the name of Bunker Hill, but most of it actually took place on a place called Breed's Hill. I don't know if you know that. Yep, yep I did. And, which and, is apparently next to you guys. Yeah, right. it is. I, I Bunker guess Bunker Hill sounds a, better. <laughs> we just have a good spot for a monument. <laughs> yeah. That's how it works. That's interesting. Um, you know, interesting. You um, you talk about um, your your back, not yet your background, the background, the diverse background of your students. So, um, just in case a lot of people didn't know, um, Pam is a cover girl. Um, I was looking back. You were on the cover of Diverse, uh, December thirteenth, two thousand fifteen. Oh, well, I'm you, yeah. If you remember that, yeah. But um, in reading about you, I see that. Um, you know, you you grew up in Florida as a Chinese immigrant. Yeah. Um, so, you know, your background, you know, diverse background is definitely similar to the students that you have. But it, it's I digress for a second. I was recently uh, I binged a show on Hulu called Fresh Off the Boat. And so and I was reading about you, I thought about that. Are you familiar with that show? I, I know of it. I haven't I haven't seen much of it. Oh, OK. Yeah, I know. But, you know, it's about it. Taiwanese family that comes to the U.S. Yeah. and right. they raise their kids in Florida. So I was like, oh, wow, very similar. So but, you know, in that family, you know, education was was definitely a big thing. And they talked about that a lot in the show. Um, and it's based upon the life of, um, I think, guy's name is Eddie Wang, who's a hmm. um, popular chef and entrepreneur and all, all types of stuff. Yeah. But um, but with your background as a person of color, um, you know, in a family that, that has that had less financial resources than most. Um, and yet, you know, that's an obstacle for a lot. But you were able to succeed. 
um, where many have not. So how did that experience help you um, inspire your students at Bunker Hill, um, the majority of which, like you said, have, have a similar background? You know, it, it is interesting that over the last eight to 10 years that I that I spent um, at Bunker Hill, you know, in the community college movement, my perspective about being an immigrant and the sense of belonging and and things like meritocracy and and, mm -hmm. and, and and how to pull oneself up by one's bootstraps. I have I have learned interesting things growing up of what I should be, you know, as a as a Chinese um, American woman, an immigrant. Um, and then what it really means um, uh, in, in, in terms of the idea of student success and equity as we look at it now. Mm -hmm. Right. So I came when I was 11. I grew up in Miami and in, um, went to an inner city high school that was like 60 percent black, maybe at that point, 20 percent um, Cuban um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and with whites. And we were the only Chinese family. Um, and my parents were middle class when they came to the United States um, mm -hmm. from Hong Kong. Right. Um, so they gave up. They gave up everything they had that was middle class, as you see it. Um, they, mm -hmm. uh, they were merchant families. And my dad worked as a Chinese restaurant waiter all his life. And my mom um, took in garment work at home so that she can be with the three kids. Their goal was to get the kids to America so that we would have better um, opportunities in education. So the idea of education has always been in the back of their minds, but they sacrificed their entire lives, right? Mm -hmm. Because my mom never learned to speak English completely. My dad is still has halting English, even though he's 88 now. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, so, so it is not different than what parents would wish for their immigrant families now, right? Whether mm -hmm. you're coming from Mexico or Central America or wherever Eastern Europe, wherever you're coming from, that sensibility of being immigrant. Um, has not changed. The fact that I was able to succeed the way I did with school, and I think my brother and sister did too, um, is less about our ability as individuals than it is about luck. Because mm -hmm. there were certainly other families around me with similar, um, with similar backgrounds and similar you know, aspirations that didn't make it the way that we did. Right. I was lucky to run into the right English teacher. Mm -hmm. I was lucky to run into the right counselor. And it's that one incident of luck that changed my trajectory to go to Barnard and then go to Columbia. Right. And as I think back upon it, and I was really proud of myself. My parents were proud of, you know, proud of their children doing well. But I realized as I was going through and working for community colleges that we shouldn't all have to depend on luck. Right. Right. So all people of color have and immigrants have to depend on luck for what my white next door neighbor can get through their social connections. Right. Mm -hmm. So that is really the root of the idea of equity. That's really that I come to learn over the last 10 years working at Bunker Hill, that student success is not just about what you learn in the classroom. It is not just about engagement in that moment in the classroom. It is really engaging all of your social capital. Right. Yeah. And, and 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 moving it forward. So yes, I answered to the most basic and the most blue blood, you know, mm -hmm. definition of meritocracy and made it to an Ivy League college. Right. Well, I'm the unicorn. Mm -hmm. I would never want anybody to have to be the unicorn because that would mean that everybody else is unequal. Mm -hmm. True. So, so I began over the last four or five years, six years, to learn a lot more about structural inequities, mm. um, structural racism, mm -hmm. um, really the, the idea of supremacy and not just white supremacy, right? Supremacy of all different kinds that that constricts our, our educational system. Community colleges are living in a four-year system. We're judged like a four-year college. Our students are considered four-year college um, um, sort of templates. And if you're a post-traditional, I don't say non-traditional, I say post-traditional. If you're a post-traditional students who are over the age of 21, mm -hmm. supporting a family with kids who are married, who are a person of color or an immigrant, anything that's marginalized outside of that iconic look of the college student, all of us are suffering from this kind of inequities. Mm 
right? So it's kind of hard to talk about what student engagement means and what student success means without deconstructing the mythology of the Asian model minority myth mm -hmm. or the unicorn in the field or that Latino student who was able to make it the MIT or those three black students who are able to break out of whatever um, poverty cycle that they're in to make it. Mm -hmm. 1% does not fix an educational system. And we're only just about 1%. So when you ask me about student success and student engagement, what I realized is how much I had to unlearn as an educator mm -hmm. right, about what brings students to success and what the definition of success means. And what else do we have to do to do student engagement in order to level the playing field, to restore the privilege right, of, our, of our students of color, of our immigrant students, of the students outside the system? in order to pull them into the system and, and, and give them what they need to succeed in the world. I, I, I get passionate about this topic because it also holds a great deal of sadness and anger, right? Of how much my parents had to sacrifice and how long I basically put aside my cultural assets and cultural wealth and my cultural identity, mm -hmm. right? In order to be sort of adjacent Right to the traditional idea of white success. Um, it's a really hard topic to talk about. Maybe not with you. Because right. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm listening and I'm. Uh, I'm nodding and thinking about like my own experiences. So. I yeah. Mean, I, I agree with you. <laughs> a thousand percent. Yeah. So. 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 Where, where. What. What was similar? What was? How was my experience similar to your trajectory? Tell me about how you define success for you as, you know, leadership in, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a publication that really highlights that kind of equity issue. What resonates for you? Oh, you know, I thought you were asking a rhetorical question like you're talking to your students. No, no, um, no, I was, I'm really interested. Uh, say it again, because now I gotta-, I gotta So, so what did I say? What, 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 which part of my experience as a woman of color coming up in higher ed resonate with your experience? Just thinking about um, being a unicorn. Yeah. You know, that, that's a good way of saying it. I mean, I, I like that. Um, you know, in some regards, I say, okay, I pulled myself up by the bootstraps. You know, I didn't. And I don't think anybody really does. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that you do yourself, but you know, I had great support from family. I had great support from friends. You know, I had teachers and people that helped me along the way. So, you know, I can never say I did it by myself. But for me, you know, like the high school that I went to was a very diverse group of, of, of people. And, I, and literally, literally this last night I was talking to someone about it. Um, I would probably say my high school was probably 35, 40 percent African-American. Yep. But when I was in class, because I was talking with someone else about, you know, particular class or something that I took in high school, I said, oh, when I was in those classes, you know, I said, my school may have been, you know, you know, lots of minority students, probably 50% minority when you threw in Asian students and, 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 and Latin students at the time. Um, but I said, in my class, you know, because I was taking advanced classes, yep. I said, oftentimes, I was the only person of color um, it's in particular, I shouldn't say only person of color, only African American in my class. Yeah. Um, there, there were a couple of um, Asian students that I recall. I don't remember yeah. any Latino students. I'm not saying that they weren't. I just don't recall. Um, and I was saying, you know, a lot of times that was uncomfortable for me. And we were talking about it. the situation we were talking about was, I think it was in ninth grade. We had to watch the show, the movie Roots, in in in, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a government class or something. And I was just like, oh, that was just the most excruciating thing for me, you know, being the only person of color uh, yeah. in there. But you know, we, we were talking, kind of moving on past that, you know, I was just sitting there thinking, I was just like, gosh, you know, why was I the only person in that class? I find it hard to believe that, you know, 35, 40 percent of my, you know, peers, if you will, from at least from an ethnic standpoint, 
didn't qualify or want to be in those types of courses. And I think about it, I think the only reason that I was there was because my parent, my mother was an educator. You know what I mean? So she pushed that. Um, and, you know, I don't know. So, but yeah, I, I think that was the part when you said the unicorn, I was thinking about that. Gosh, I said that was me all the way through through school. And it's, it's hard um, in hindsight, looking back on it, you know, because there were a lot of times that I had insecurities over that. Yeah. You, know, uh, I, you know, it's funny. I, I mean, I still do. <laughs> you know, it is it is not that experience happens still over and over again in the professional world. It is only very recently um, in New England when I walk into a, a room, a leadership room or, or, or you know, a, a C-suite collection of people um, that I'm the only Asian woman, I'm mm-hmm. the only woman of color. Um, yeah. It is. It still is um, rare enough for me to re- realize that this idea of being the unicorn. Yeah, uh, it is. It's real. So I think part of part of student success and student engagement. And I know that you know, with, with Ceci, the idea of Ceci in the background, mm-hmm. um, the, the traditional understanding of student engagement is very much around the idea of a classroom. Right. You go in and whatever it is that the teacher can do or um, collectively as a class that you can do to allow the students to feel belong, to not feel like an imposter mm-hmm. or to, you know, not, not be the unicorn. Um, and therefore they, they are retained, they persist, and then they complete and succeed, right? That was the idea. Yeah. Um, you can do it through making sure that their academics is sound, uh, that, that they have enough support and tutoring and all of that stuff. Yeah, no, it's um, that ex- you're talking about experience and exposure to things, right? Right. It, so it kind of makes me think about um, going back to that article I was reading yesterday um, in Diverse um, with you. And we, I think in the article, oh gosh, what was it? Am it's I saying it right? Learn and Earn? Is that a program? Learn earn, right, the Learn and Earn program. That's right. It, I think it was Dr. Fifield, I guess, maybe yeah. started and you continue. But I was very impressed by that. It was talking about... Um, giving your students experiences um, and what I thought were types of companies. I remember, I think it said Bank of America and Raytheon okay. companies that, you know, traditionally I don't think of as places that are giving interns to community college students. Yeah. So I, I, I think so. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's the type of experience I, I'm, I'm typically here about, you know, at four year institutions. So how has that program worked for your students and how has it evolved since then? Yeah, that's um, a good them going into these types of C-suite spaces and yeah. Fortune 500 companies and getting exposure. Uh, you know, that is a really good question because there's a lesson in there, too, about what we're unlearning. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it has been going like gangbusters and it's coming on, you know, more than a decade now. So about three or four years, four, about four years ago, um, we had new leadership coming into that program. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and she said to me, Pam. Have you looked at who was taking advantage of this program? So I said, no, do do a data disaggregation. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, we were committing the sins of skimming the top, right? So mm. students doing the internships are the white students, international students, full-time students. Uh. And it in no way reflected the diversity of the college. I said, we got to fix this. Interesting. So, so we so we we started recruiting differently. Mm-hmm. We're realizing that first generation students, students of color who are not used to this type of programming have a lot of self-doubt and they will look at a job description and say, I can't do that. That's not me. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm no unicorn. And mm-hmm. then they don't come. So instead of waiting for students to come to us, we're now going into the classes right. that they're taking. And we're saying, you've learned these things in your class. These are the things that the jobs are doing, going for. You succeeded in this class and therefore you could be going at this job. So we're literally pulling students out and saying, yes, you're not used to this. This is not in your background, but you know how to do it because you've learned it in class already. So come and try. Right. So it is it is the pulling Mm -hmm. and 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 saying to students, don't let your idea of what an intern looks like, white, male, 17, 18, 19, don't let that don't let that cloud your understanding of your own talents. Right. right. So right. now four years hence, when I did the last data disaggregation, the dean showed it to me. 
we reflect mm -hmm. who our students are. We are quarter white, quarter black, quarter Latinx, right. Right? 50% Asian. We have, we have students who are older, who are more mature. We have mm -hmm. students who are traditional age. So I, I tell the story because even something as simple as an internship program mm -hmm. can fall victim to the structural inequities if we are not looking, right? The most well-meaning things that we craft to think that, okay, this will be a program that would be great for community colleges. We still weren't looking with a clear enough equity lens. So data, to disaggregate by data, to know who your students are, is so important. I, I, I'm, and, and here's the other thing. We used to have just students going to businesses, right? Banks and, and defense, you know, defense companies mm -hmm. and so on. Now we realize there's some students who wants to be in museums. They want to be in government. They want to be in fields right. that don't pay so much. Right, right. right. Serve, their service fields. And these companies, you know, or these agencies can't always afford to hire the interns because we will not do non-pay internships. It is mm -hmm. the biggest inequity problem. So what we're doing now is cost sharing, right? The museum will pay half. We will go out and fundraise with the foundation to fill the other half. So okay. now we have non-traditional students in non-traditional fields. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not just locking everybody into this. Well, if you want to make money, you go into this track. Right, right. It, it's, it's, I always worry that we create an underclass of mm -hmm. workers because we say, oh, these people, uh, these folks who are, you know, students of color, they really need a job quick. Let's train them up for like three, six months and put them into the workplace. Right. right. What are we training? All right. Uh, I, I, what kind of engagement is that really for a world that looks for lifelong learners? Right. Right. So I'm 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 unlearning a lot, Ralph. I'm unlearning a lot of what was traditional higher education, mm -hmm. and and the inhospitable environment for students of color. Yeah, particularly black and brown men. Yeah. No, I mean, um, just listening to you. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm I'm seeing now why. Um, you 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 were honored. And, uh, I'm speaking of the um, of the. Uh, I was reading about the the White House uh, yeah. champion for change for college opportunity thing. Um, you you're a change agent. I see that you know you don't let the status quo be. So um, well, it, you know I, I I would love to embrace that honor and say mm -hmm. yeah that is so. But it, it is. It comes with a lot of, I think it comes with a, with all people who want to impose change, right? Mm -hmm. It comes with a lot of grief because so much of what I knew and what I thought was right 20 years ago, 10 years ago, is not holding. Um, the more I learn, the more I see, the more I, the more I realize how deep seated. Oh my gosh. You know, some of these, some of these systems of inequities are. I mean, it's, it's um, I don't know, not, not a cliche, it's not the right word I'm looking for, but um, when you hear people talk about institutional racism and things like that, that word is really on point, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because when you talk about how deep-seated and entrenched some of this stuff is, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's going to... It's going to take a long time to untangle it, if you will. Or, or if, you know, maybe it is really the journey and not the destination, right? I mean, as a nation, the way that we've looked at higher education and the way that we've ranked higher education mm -hmm. is in itself a symptom. There's only about two or three percent who are in the IV pluses. Right. Like all of our students. Fifty percent of the students are in community colleges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, it, that unicorn thing, I refuse to believe that you we that we only have three or four percent of our population, whether they're people of color or not, who are capable of deep high talent. Right. It, it it's 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 the way we choose to select and call. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. so yeah, it is, you know, I, yes, it is important work. Yes, it is change agent work, but it's also slow. Yeah. Um we, folks have forgotten about George Floyd. <laughs> yeah. Um, folks will likely collect 
forget about the anti-Asian hate in the same way that mm-hmm. they've forgotten about what we did with the Muslim ban three or four years ago. Yeah, yeah. Or the internment of the Japanese in Absolutely. World War II, right? Or the Chinese Exclusion Act before that in 1619. Yeah, I know. I was, I was literally just talking to someone about the Chinese exclusion thing. I was in Portland a few weeks ago, and mm-hmm. I was reading about how there's a lot of Chinese labor there, and that you know Chinese people were not allowed to bring family. They couldn't buy anything there. It was just, it was just labor, and it's, it almost seems of what we know today about America that that was unfathomable. But actually, in hindsight, it really isn't. But oh. yeah. Because we, you know, that the I think there is a national impulse to exclude, and it's mm-hmm. only, right. It's only by really doing the work that you and I do, or a lot of my colleagues do, that would go back and and undo that impulse, right, right. And, and to impose something else. And I I don't see this work being done in the in the next decade. And I know that folks are folks are impatient and. Mm-hmm. And, and they don't believe in iterative change. Yeah. Um, I don't know how else to do it. Yeah. But I mean, you're doing something right. I mean, uh, how, I mean, in order to get some of the things done that you guys have gotten done, I mean, I think obviously, you know, it comes from the top, you know, and sometimes things are grassroots. Um, and, and in the case of, at Bunker Hill, it could be both. So, I mean, I definitely think you know, you've had, you guys have had involvement from everybody, you know, probably admissions, faculty, financial aid, you know, students, um, your staff. So yeah, what's been the key for you of getting everybody on the same page to do some oh, of these things? Oh, my goodness. Um, I, I, I think, I think the realization that it is not a one. So, so I really do believe the saying is true that you cannot dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Mm-hmm. You cannot dismantle systemic inequities by superimposing um, command and control. Right, <laughs> right? Right, right. You, 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 can't, you can't be a dictator to dictate democracy. It does not work that way. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, I think, the, the ability to tolerate um, multiple things happening at the same time. Sometimes they're in opposition, but allow them to grow and mature enough and then bring people together for conversations. You got to meet people where they are, right? right? Yeah. So in, in my faculty and staff on campus, even though I believe that we really are a very progressive bubble on campus, we still have folks that don't believe that structural inequities exist or mm-hmm. white supremacy is not a thing. And we have some folks who have suffered for it. Right. And have experienced some of those things. So in order for me to be able to embrace growth and bring them together, I cannot completely discount people's feelings and experience. Mm-hmm. Right. So I need to say to the person who doesn't believe that that supremacy exists or that we have these ine- inequities is to is to show and not tell to say, look, 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 look at the data. Look at how our students are not progressing. Look at which groups are not progressing. Look at the things that are surrounding it that are falling apart that is not supporting the students and where does that come from, right? I have to Mm -hmm. trust that even though they're not there yet, they have the intellect to get there, right? So that's one group. And the other group that has experienced all of these horrible things, I have to be able to say to them, yes, what what you experience is horrible and all of your experiences are valid. Let's look forward on how to bring that back to the table to do better. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it works, sometimes it blows up in my face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, what else are you gonna do, right? So to me, leadership is being able to build a table that's big enough and build a kitchen big enough so everybody can cook. Gotcha. Um, I don't always succeed. And, and, it, and it's hard to do this work in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, oh yeah. Um... But, you know, you're doing it because and and you're succeeding because you are a leader. And I think um, a lot of our audience probably don't know that um, you have your doctorate in Japanese literature. (laughs) So, you know, this one's funny. (laughs) It's it's funny because I I was talking to my my daughter the other day and she was, you know, was always talking about this STEM major she was going to do in college. And the other day she was like, um, you know, I don't want to disparage anything, but she was telling me she now wants to major in this. And my first reaction was like, well, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> you know, 
and, and I'm sure people may have said, okay, what are you yeah, going to do with that? Doctorate right. in Japanese literature. Well, but, can... you know, <laughs> how, 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 how does that help you well, today? I think it gets better than that, right? So when I, when I, when I was at, when I was going to college, I wanted to be a journalist. Mm-hmm. And then I ended up being an English major and I did my, and I did my final paper on Zorro New Hurston. Mm-hmm. Harlem Renaissance. So, so my parents are looking at it going, okay. And then I have absolutely no background in, Je- in, in, in a, about East Asia and Japan um, mm-hmm. growing up. I did it because I loved the aesthetics of Japan, which is very close to modernism. Mm-hmm. And, and my love in art and aesthetics is really modernism. Um, I think where it helps is that I don't care what culture you study and what liberal art pieces that you embrace, at the center of all of that is the centrality of of humanism, right? Right. And it doesn't matter if you're Japanese or Chinese or a Buddhist or a Christian or whatever creed that that you subscribe to, at the core of it is human potential and kindness. Um, And that piece I come back to over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And having and developing the patience to delve deeply into one topic. Right to be able to sit in the East Asian Library at Columbia and spend right. hours and hours and hours and hours, right, detangling ancient texts, mm-hmm. reading a language that is not native to me. There is a sense of patience there that I think mm. that is missing in leadership. Patience, days, right? You want to do it tomorrow. You need to get it done tomorrow. You need to all of a sudden become, you know, from, go from conservative to progressive in one election cycle. Right, right. It, life doesn't happen that way. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes having the ability to delve deep in Japanese literature and having the value system that's more universal that I can generalize. Mm-hmm. At this point, if I had another 40 years to my life, which I know I don't, um, I could easily become a doctor mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. it is the value that grounds you, right? And, right? and not your skills, your skills that you can learn. So I've sort of separated those two. Right. Um, and a lot of people worry too much about how much money they'll make. And the fact is that the liberal arts majors catch up. Um, yeah. And they do, because you know, I can tell within our family it has caught up. Yeah. Um, it, it, my, my, my lesson to my 17, 18, 19 year old son when he was uh, at that age, and he's 21 now, is you're 21 now. An average male lives to 80. You have 60 more years to work. Right. <laughs> so don't define, you know, everything that you want to do by the first thing that you're going to study. And then they don't. Students don't. So what yeah. does your daughter want to study? Um, you know, she was wanting to be a vet from, oh, okay. you know, since she could talk. Yeah. And then I would say, you know, she because this, this is my youngest. She just graduated from high school uh, on, on Saturday. Oh, great. Uh, so I would say, and then she went to a, you know, special school here for biotech. So yep. she was doing um, forensics. Yes. Studying yes. to be um, a forensic scientist. Yep. So, you know, she got her um, diploma in that bio field. Yeah. And then she tells me, yeah, I'm going to study women's, women's studies in college. Yep. <laughs> and I'm just like, well, how did you go from all of this to that? So, you yeah. Know, it was just, it, I gave her an incredulous look, but, you know, yeah. as a father, you know, as a parent, you know, you got to support your kids and whatever they want to do. So well, are you I, I had to quickly clean that up, <laughs> you know, right. I said, okay, that's well, good. You, you, you can say to her, you know, how do you merge those two fields? Mm-hmm. Maybe mm-hmm. she can. You know, it, 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 it's possible. You, you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm, you know, I've got, I've got a son right now. His, his major is in neuroscience. Mm-hmm. or neuropsychology and is looking at med school but he also has a minor in Japanese literature and Japanese language right so you know maybe he goes and does a medical thing in Japan who knows right right you know, you know no you're right I mean it's like my oldest she same thing she right. is um, as your son she wants to study neuroscience she yeah. and uh, that's what she's doing but she's telling me now that she's um Decided she's going to do a minor in history and econ, and wow. then wants to get her master's in history. 
And I'm like, what kind of combination is this? <laughs> You know, I, I don't know, but you know, <laughs> lots of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna let the chips fall, you know, because the last thing I want to do is is, you know, armchair quarterback their right. their academics, you know. Um, it, it I also agree with you. you. You've you, done an amazing job as a dad because they have the imagination, right, to be able to reach across fields. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So congratulations. Well, thank you. Um, appreciate it. Okay, I want to move forward here. Talk a little <laughs> bit more about the um, <laughs> student support services. You, yeah. you, you mentioned um, yes. the pandemic, and that was um, yeah. kind of one of the topics I uh, we wanted to get into in regards to success there. So right. talk to us about the actions that Bunker Hill took um, to ensure that students knew about and were able to utilize support services to help them succeed during right. the pandemic. And now what is our new normal? At least for now. So, so that's that's actually a, a, the the topic of a talk that I gave <laughs> about nine months ago. Okay. Uh, about the role of community colleges in the pandemic, um, mm-hmm. and 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 what we need to do to move sort of to the next iteration, right, of the community college identity, and it is all wrapped up in knowing who our students are and understanding what are the components, right, that makes up a, a, a true support system. Right. And in talking about that, because my school is diverse, um, I, 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 I spoke a great deal about most students of color, first generation students, low income students, um, because that's basically where the focus is. And to me, it's kind of like a three legged stool. Right. Mm-hmm. One is that you've got to have the support in the classroom. And it is about how to get students out of development and education quickly into college level to succeed and developing the acumen to to get the academic pieces done well, right? So tutoring is part of that, Um, um, whether it's in class embedded or it is supported with a center um, or individually with supplemental um, um, instruction. And we do two or three of those models. We have tutoring centers and we're intrusive about that, right? We connect our faculty to it and therefore the students are connected to it. Mm -hmm. The second part is about money. I mean, plain and simple money. <laughs> yeah. Right. Our students don't drop out of school because they couldn't hack algebra. They drop right. out of school because something happened in their family. Maybe their kid got sick, the car lost the carburetor, they couldn't pay the rent, whatever. Mm-hmm. Community college education and higher education, community college students in terms of education is a luxury good, right? It is not something that's at the center of their lives. Four out of five of my students work, and most a lot of them full time. Three out of five are parents. Half of those parents mm. are single moms, right? So if your life is going on, everything's okay. You're taking classes to get whatever certificate to go forward. Something happens. What is the first thing you drop? Mm-hmm. Not your kids, not your job, not your housing, not your right. It's, it's going to be the school. So having enough money to keep them in school, and not only that, having enough money for their basic needs. Um, of food, housing, childcare. So a lot of our work now at the college is we have a pantry at school. Right. Right. During the pandemic, students couldn't come. We delivered 40 orders a week. Delivered. Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, how else are we going to get the food? <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, um, I, I was um, talking to the president of Palo Alto College a few weeks ago, and he was saying they had something similar. Yeah. And he didn't, um, Dr. Garza did not, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? delve into how the students got the food. I just made the assumption they came on campus to to get it. So they may have been delivered it too. So in my mind, you came to pick it up. Right. Yeah. So there there is some of that until we had to shut down the whole college. Mm -hmm. And what happened was we partnered with a community partner um, Mm -hmm. who had a transportation system that went around the city. So we just, you know, sort of doubled up. So part of the, um, so it's, it's money and food. Right. Mm-hmm. To, to, to get the students um, to stay in school. It is the classroom support. The last piece of it is interesting. We used to think that those two things would keep them there. Right. But it's not true. The sense okay. of belonging. Mm. Right. To have um, young black and, and brown gentlemen who come to the school, knowing that the school is not going to be welcoming to them. I still get that same feeling. I walk on the I walk on the campus of Harvard and I feel like I don't belong there. Mm -hmm. Um, it it, it is, we are, we have not, we have done so much to build the, to build the school to prison pipeline. Uh, We have not done enough to build a school to college pipeline. 
for our black and brown populations. Mm -hmm. We know it, we, we see it every day. We think we're separate from it, we're not. A lot of our students who have not experienced higher ed or have no context in their family, they don't like the school because they come and the teachers seem like they're, they're, they're you know, that, that they are, they're not relating. They don't see people like them, right? I don't have, mm -hmm. I don't have enough black and brown men teachers or administrators. I mean, I have a, a good number, but not enough to support in the way that we support. So we built affinity groups. Mm -hmm. We have a group called HOPE, Halting Oppressive Pathways Through Education. Right. We're, we're naming the problem. The pathways are oppressive, right? Right, right, right. So they have a peer mentor who's kind of like a coach to them, who is a year ahead of them. We pay those students to coach the younger students. Um, they come together for meals. They come together in community that is not necessarily academic. Like <laughs> they took a bunch of money and went out and had dinner together. I'm like, good. They need that connection, right? So we're fostering a different kind of community that is identity-based. Controversial, but it works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I got like a 14% retention gain with the whole cohort. Mm -hmm. So that I, I don't care how you get together, you get together, you stay, you do it. Right. So right, we're doing right. that with our um, uh, we're beginning. We did. We're doing this with our um, black and black and brown men, mm -hmm. in particular, because that's where the data says we need help. Right. Um, we're doing this with our Asian American Pacific Islander community. We're mm -hmm. doing this with our Latino community. Um, we're we're going to sort of ramp up all of those. So if I'm a quarter black, quarter white, quarter lot next. And a quarter, you know, 15% Asian and, and these affinity groups are working. When you group them together, you're going to get the move, right? In the, in, in the, you're going to move the needle. So, so am I hearing you right to say you don't have one plan, if you will, but the, the plan is very narrow and strategic for each of those groups? Yeah. Well, yes and no. I, I do mm -hmm. have a one. So, so the undergirthing plan. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the pathway work. We're doing pathway work. So right. everybody who comes in is a, 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 would declare an interest, science, whatever. And there's a pathway that's articulated for that student. Right. And there are coaches along the pathway, right? right. But there's a cross-cutting mm -hmm. of identity pieces. So you have, you have a safety net that's underneath that's pathway coaching. And then depending on who you are, you have these layers, right? right. Because we're not all one identity. It, exactly. Right. Um, uh, exactly. So, right. So the scaling up, people always want to say, oh, let's scale up and do it for 16,000 students. Well, student A is not the same as student B, right? Don't be lumping all BIPOC people together and saying we're all the same. I can't tell you apart. Right? Exactly. Exactly. It's a different kind of racism. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, now, that. <laughs> I get it. And so like, um, you have, you know, the the obvious that everybody sees. Okay, you're black, right. you're you're, you're right. Asian, you're Latin. Um, so when you're working with the students, are you then further breaking them down? <laughs> I don't mean that in a negative way, but no, breaking no, I, them down to find out about, you know, what is their home life like? What do they work? Do they not work? Do you yeah. have children? You know, all those types of things. Is that part of? you know, the guided pathways that you get to to help them succeed. We, we're getting to that point. In fact, because of the pathway work that we're doing, we got a front end to our student information system. Mm -hmm. We're using a, a, a piece of software um, called TargetX. Okay. We're beginning to collect data that's not just your, you know, in-state, out-of-state data. We now right. know if they have children. Mm -hmm. We now know, you know, um, um, a, a lot more. Um, it, well, we've always had location. Right. Um, and we are now beginning to, I think, collect data about if they work and how much they work. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, it sounds really coherent when I say it to you, Ralph. Right. And I don't want to imply that it is so good that we know what we're doing in all of this, because all of this is really young. Right. The, the identity and affinity student engagement pieces are really young across the United States. Mm -hmm. We know that the HBCUs do it really well. Right. Right. They have always done it well. That's why their medical schools, when we look into it, have a 15, 20 percent higher success rate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Than, right, than all the other medical schools. We know that affinity works. 
What I'm trying to say to people is we need to give it a try and not let it get caught up in the culture wars. Right. Right. Because I don't want people saying, oh, they're just a woke campus. No, we're more than just a woke campus. Mm. We are a campus who knows our students. Right. Right. And really respect their cultural wealth, really respect their asset. That doesn't mean that we're ignoring that the larger world out there, that's primarily white. And we need to teach students how to navigate that. Mm-hmm. But I don't want them to do what I did, which is to give up some of that cultural wealth in order to navigate the white world and then losing all of those pieces. Right. Right. Now I'm reclaiming it. But man, you know, I'm old. I don't have many more years to reclaim that. <laughs> I didn't want to lose it in the first place. Right. Right. No, I mean, um, I think that's hard for. Um, I'll just say a white person, um, male or female, Mm -hmm. to understand um, how it is for a person of color to feel like you lost some of your identity to assimilate, if you will, into America. Right. Um, we, and I think we all do it and we know how, you know, yeah, you, you we do. code switch all the time. Right? Exactly. That's, that's a good word. Code switching. Um, and I think, you know, they don't understand that or at least yeah. maybe have empathy for it. Well, and, 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 and it's, you know, it's it's partly, I think, some of the writers now who are writing about the issue of race and color mm-hmm. um, are actually much more nuanced than the first generation of writers. Right. So mm-hmm. when you look at somebody like Heather McGee, right, who's uh, who the author of The Sum of Us, her conclusion about what she calls the solidarity dividend is very different than the first generation of folks who are working in the affinity space saying we got to claim our own. She's saying if you take that, the, I mean, in my mind, she uses the swimming pool analogy, which is. When the whites of the 1950s filled in the swimming pool, not mm-hmm. only did the black community suffer, right? All the communities suffer because they still haven't rebounded from the idea of filling in a swimming pool and taking away resources from everybody. Right, right. right? So, so I think she is much more sophisticated in her thinking. And I think that solidarity piece, mm-hmm. right? Because the, the people who are in hope, who are doing the program for the black and, and, and brown men, are learning from the the folks who are doing the program in the API group or in the Hispanic group Mm -hmm. and vice versa, right? And sharing resources on how they're supporting students in their own affinity group. So I think that kind of solidarity dividend that Heather McGee talks about is where I'm trying to get to. I'm trying to stay away from the, you know, we got to claim our group and nobody else kind kind of stuff. Right, right. But it's hard, it's really hard. Now, here, here's something um, I want to ask you about um, before we end here. Um, you know, we talk about the academic needs, the home support needs, just that and, and the other, um, all of those, you know, leading to, to student success. But I think, you know, one of the big things that's going on on campus, I mean, not just campus, I think, just around the country in general, um, is how are you guys offering support for your students Um on the non-academic side, uh, in particular, looking at mental health and well-being. So in the in the middle of the pandemic, we realized that mental health is really a public crisis. Mm-hmm. And, um, and not only that, it is triggered at that point by anti-Black racism. Uh, it was at the end of Floyd, right, uh, during right. that period of Breonna Taylor and, 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 and the murders um, that are, um, are people of color, particularly Black men. Mm-hmm. Again, it is that is the demographic that is really suffering the most and that we had to do something to support both our employees and our students. So I commissioned um, a large group of people. It's like a group of 40 people um, to be uh, I, I, I commissioned a mental health commission study. And that has three parts to it. Um, one part is about um, student mental health support and, 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 and strategies. One part is about employee mental health support during the pandemic and 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 the um and the and the uprising um and 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 solutions. And the third part was a study on um how to implement trauma-informed teaching and learning and service. Mm-hmm. Right. So so you do professional development. What that that huge big group came together and and study and made recommendations. Now I have a three-year plan right. on those three levels. 
And for employees, we made sure that um, employee assistance programs are vibrant, that people can get to help when they need help, that they do 24-7 calling. Mm -hmm. Um, We started telework, um, being able to be much more flexible about how people teach and work. Um, So that's a a good part of it. Um, And and for the students, we have taken on a 24-7 mental health hotline. Mm-hmm. Students can call. We are creating um, for the first time a physical mental health counseling center on campus. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the third part, we've done um, some beginning professional development about how to approach and engage with students that we know have suffered trauma, either through the pandemic or other things. Right. Um, so it, it is. <laughs> we're trying to project manage this thing through our project management office. Mm-hmm. It's a three-year plan. Right, right. And we're right. just going to, you know, sort of pound through the bucket of work that we need to do. Gotcha. Um, it's expensive. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I mean, I guess it's one of those things, like, you know, we can never put a price on, I guess. But I, I, I understand the sentiment of what you're saying. About it. Yeah. So, so there are, you know, there are concrete things. Um, mm-hmm. But beyond the concrete things that we're doing, that the, you know, professional development or whatever it is, it is also a signal to the campus that this is not a flash in the pan. Mm-hmm. 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 Right? Because there are 40, 45 people who are part of the mental health commission and now part of the mental health advisory. And we've turned it right. into an advisory now. And we will call one another to account. Gotcha. Okay. It, yeah, this stuff is freaking exhausting. I can tell you. Well. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, <clears throat> we, we're we're starting to to run run short on time here. There were some other things I wanted to ask you, but we're going to have to. But you know, I think the essence of those questions, you know, you you definitely spoke to and answered, and and some of the other things. So, um, in, in closing here, um, the team at Sessi. Um, Yes. They um, how, how do I want to put this? They, they they want me to be Oprah-esque, if you will. So uh, I haven't seen Oprah in a while, but apparently she ends her interviews asking people to fill in the blank. OK, on, on something. So I thought you were going to give me a car, but I guess. Not. <laughs> <laughs> now that, <laughs> wow. Yes. No, that would be good, wouldn't it? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I remember my, my, my wife went to an Oprah show one time and really? I was so excited. I was like, what did you get? What did you get? I thought you know, she was going to come home with something great, but yeah. she, she went on one of the off days. Oh, I see Man, so, so they got two questions for you. Okay. And I got okay. one. So I, I'm, I'm going to start with their first one. I've, I've complete the sentence. So support services matter to student success because. Because the students we serve come with different levels of privilege Mm. and student engagement and student support evens the playing field. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Um, Okay. And the second one is we can make support services inescapable when? We can make support services. What is the rest of it? Inescapable? Inescapable. When? Now. Hmm. Okay. I, I can tell you clearly in my mind because of the things that I've been seeing, every single one of our 1,200 community colleges mm-hmm. in the field and tribal colleges in the field mm-hmm. have some level of understanding, if not sophisticated levels of understanding of what it means to have student support services. Right. Whether we can afford it or whether we're giving the resources to implement it, that's another question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is top of mind with everybody I speak with. It's there. We need to fund it. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, absolutely. Okay. okay. Last question. And this is this, You're this, tough, man. <laughs> this, 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 this might put you on the spot now. Okay. So before you came to Bunker Hill, you were at, if I read it right, Moorpark College, right? Correct. In, in in California. Yeah. So big game tomorrow. So who you got? The Warriors or the Celtics? Oh. <laughs> if the Celtics would stop dropping the god darn ball, 
after <laughs> leading like 55 points in the first quarter, I'd be, of course, of course, the Celtics until I cross Mississippi and then I'm going to root for the other team. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Good. good oh, they, they have been just, oh, exasperating. Yeah. It's, 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 um, <laughs> I, I get it. I feel for the fan. I don't, I'm not a fan of either team, if you will, from a who I root for on a normal basis. But uh, yeah. emotionally, I, I could tell both fan bases have to be on a roller coaster. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> it's yeah. kind of like being at work. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, I'm, I'm gonna call you Dr. Pam. <laughs> yeah, <I'll> just <laughs> Thank you for your time. We truly appreciate it, and. Um, any closing remarks you want to say? No, you... I, I, I really enjoyed the conversation and I'm grateful actually um, to you um, and you. your organization because if it weren't for you folks constantly calling us back to what is the important focus, mm-hmm. I think it's very easy for higher education to devolve, right? Back to the old systems, back to the old conversations Mm-hmm. Um, and you know you're you're doing what journalism is supposed to do. Right, right. No, thank you. Call us to account, and I appreciate it. So, right, thank you. Thank you.